Hello, I'm Bill Penberthy and I'm a developer advocate with AWS. My primary focus is on .NET and enterprise application development. So one of my favorite parts of this job is showing you the ways that AWS can help you save money and make your application more scalable and reliable. In this session, we'll be doing just that as we quickly containerize .NET and Java applications uh, with AWS app to container So we have a pretty simple agenda. First, we'll quickly review why you should containerize your applications. Next, we'll go over AWS app to container and then we'll talk a little bit about when and why you would use it. And then we'll show it by containerizing a running .NET application. So why should you containerize your application? You know, that seems like a pretty valid question. To get an idea of why you should consider containerizing your application, let's start with some of the details on containers. First of all, a container, it consists of the entire runtime environment. All the files, application files, libraries, and all necessary configuration files are all part of this package. These containers, and typically there are multiple of them installed on a server, all share the server operating system with these containers basically accessing the OS in read-only mode. So this is what it looks like. At the bottom, you have the infrastructure. Think of it as the hardware. The next layer above, the host operating system, contains the operating system kernel. The next higher layer is the container manager, which typically supports multiple containers. Um, the container manager basically Think of it as abstracting out the container and managing things like ensuring that each container is running as, a, as an independent, isolated process. So why should you containerize your app? And these are why. A container may only be tens of megabytes in size. Remember, the container is only running the application on all of its parts. And because of this, a single server can host far more containers than it can host virtual machines, thus less overhead. Also, since all of the running bits are bundled together, the containerized application will run the same everywhere. Consider non-containerized deployment of your application. In some approaches, this means replacing the old bits with the new bits. In other approaches, it means a complete replacement of the previous application. But they're all running in the context of those various servers, so that means that you have to have all of those servers you know, set up and configured the same way to ensure that a deployment will work the same in multiple places. And that's not easy. And it's certainly not near as reliable as deploying your application in a container. Another major benefit is that containerized applications can be started almost instantly. This does amazing things for scalability because it means containers can be instantiated in a, in a just-in-time fashion when they're needed and can disappear when they're no longer required, freeing up resources on their host. And when they aren't being used, you don't have to pay for them. Lastly, by the fact that all of these points demonstrate how containerization supports agile development and DevOps. So let's talk about AWS app to container and how it can help you containerize your applications. So what is app to container app to container was released in June, 2020, and is a command line tool that helps transform existing applications into containers without requiring any code changes. What apt container does is discover the applications that are running on a server. These applications could be ASP.NET web applications running under Microsoft IIS, or they could be Java applications running standalone or in, in app servers such as Apache Tomcat, IBM WebSphere, or, or Oracle WebLogic. Uh, once apt container discovers the applications that are running on the server, you're given the opportunity to identify the application, and then, from that application, apt container identifies any dependencies and then wraps the application and those dependencies up and creates a container image that can be deployed to Amazon EKA, EKS or ECS. So the main thing to remember is that it's designed to help you containerize running instances of websites running on .NET and Java. So you may recognize the picture on the left. That's Microsoft IIS and the websites that are running on that box. The right-hand image is the equivalent in Apti Container, where Apti Container, uh, remember it's a command line tool, is showing the list of applications running on the server. Also, please remember that while these images are only showing IIS, you have the same ability when working with Java application servers. 
So there are some obvious candidates for when apt container makes a lot of sense. And they're when one or more of the applications that are you know, already running and deploying on the server, regularly used but not regularly maintained, uh, the application may not already be included in a deployment process, or they're not currently deployed in a way that's uh, redundant or scalable. As you'll see firsthand in the demo, apt container is designed to take working applications, package them into a container, and then support your deployment of that newly created container. Apto Container does not do anything with the source code or anything other than package up that running application, which is why you need to have it deployed and running. The next indicator that Apto Container may be an appropriate approach is when you have an application that you've deployed onto a server and are using regularly, eh, but are not really actively maintaining. We've all seen some of those. You know, these could be as simple as uh, timekeeping applications or or homegrown expense or bug tracking systems, or they could be as complex as installed and running you know, content management or customer relationship management systems. And that you're still considering an application for containerizing implies that there may not already be a full CI CD pipeline in place for that system. And most likely you're probably more concerned with backup and restoration than you are with being able to deploy the full application. Another instance that makes sense is when you've installed the application manually. Uh, pretty common when using third-party systems. Rather than having to make sure that you install them the exact same way again, take the working application, containerize it, and then you don't have to worry about any misconfiguration. And lastly, when your system is not deliberately redundant or scalable. You know, many of these systems likely won't need the scalability, but that you're still using them shows that there's a need for some redundancy. You can easily add that by creating a container for the application. So when would you use it? You would use it for something as simple as a small web app that you deployed through the IDE, you know, six years ago. You could also use it for that larger application that, uh, that went through an installation process and perhaps even multiple version updates, all of which means you'll probably never get another version of that software installed again in exactly the same way. And then, everything in between. So now that we've talked apt to container up a little bit, let's go over some of the details around using it and then we'll take a look at it. So before we get into the demo, let's talk about getting ready to use apt to container. The first thing that you need to do is determine where you're going to run the containerization process. So let's go over the requirements for that system. The first and most significant is that the Docker image must be uh, installed. If you already have Docker installed, or you're willing to install it on the server, then it's relatively simple. If, however, um, you're unable or would rather not install the Docker engine uh, on the server that you're gonna be analyzing, you can set up a worker machine that can do the work. And some examples where it may make sense to go with a worker machine are say, when your application servers are running in an internal data center and they don't have internet access, at that point it would be hard to deploy from those machines so it would make sense to use a worker machine. Another example where a worker machine may make the most sense is if you have multiple servers with different apps, and especially if they do not already have Docker installed, installing Docker on the worker machine and using that to do all the containerization would be much simpler than installing Docker on all of those other machines. Also, if you're looking at uh, using a worker machine, one recommendation that, that, uh, that I have is to use an EC2 instance that's based on one of the machine instance types that is optimized for Amazon ECS. That means you won't even have to, to install Docker. So after you've determined where you're gonna run the containerization process, the next thing is to install all of the prerequisites. The main one, other than Docker that we've already talked about, is that you need to have AWS tools for PowerShell already installed on all of the machines that you're gonna be working with. Um, you'll also, obviously, uh, need to install apt container, but we'll go over that as part of the demo. Otherwise, <laughs> it'd be a pretty short demo. And before we get into the demo, let's take a quick look at the workflow that we're gonna go through. Think of it as a, as a teaser reel for the demo. After all of the prerequisites are fulfilled, um, including installing apt container we start by initializing apt container. This will ask for some configuration information. 
Uh, the first is the workspace directory path. This will be the local directory on the machine where Apti Container will store all the various artifacts. The next is the AWS profile to use. Um, you'll, you'll have already set that up as part of the AWS tools for PowerShell installation. Then you have the option to provide an S3 bucket for storing various artifacts during the process. Hopefully we'll talk more about that in the, uh, in the demo. And then AWS asks for permission to collect usage metrics. So this contains information about the host operating system, application type, the app to container commands that you're doing, as well as uh, notifications around any problems or errors that may have occurred as you're running the application. The last initialization question is whether you want to ensure that the images are signed using Docker Content Trust or, or DCT. After app to container has been initialized, you can start actually containerizing your apps. The first step you need to perform after you initialize app to, container, uh, app to container is to get a list of available applications. In this case, since we'll be on Windows, we will get a list of applications running on IIS. The next step is to select and analyze the application that you're choosing to uh, containerize. You'll see this in the demo. This is where it's going to do the work to understand what's going on with that application, uh, its dependencies, its IIS settings, all the things that you need to be able to do to run that application on a different server. And once analyzed, you can actually transform the application. That's doing the work to containerize. So remember, there are two different uh, workflow processes. The first is where is when the server running the application is also the server that will be doing all of the processing. If, however, you're using a worker machine, then you will need to do two extra steps during that, uh, that transform process. The first is to extract the application, and then you would contain it, containerize it. Uh, the extract basically takes it up, bundles it all up, and creates all of the information that you need about that application so that it can understand how to containerize it. But when you're working on the application server, however, you'll find that you really only need to run the containerize command. Once you've created the deployment artifacts, the last thing to do is to deploy the, the newly containerized application. And so this is what we're going to go do next. All right, let's start the demo. First thing that we're going to do is let's go log into our server over here. All right, here we go. So what I'm logging into right now is my Windows 2019 server that's going to be running IIS that holds my applications on it. Next thing that we're going to do is we're going to go down, go down, go to... Uh, aws.amazon.com slash app to container. And so this will give us our landing page for the application. This is the best place to start out. It'll give you some information. It'll give you go over the benefits. It'll talk about how it works and things like that. You can also get some features here and some uh, frequently asked questions. If you click on this button right up here, it'll take us to the tutorials for uh, installing the app. Uh, you know, just in case you aren't uh, taking notes now, this will help you remember how to do it in the future. So let's go ahead into the containerizing a .NET application for Windows. So we're going to go ahead and assume that you have the AWS tools for Windows PowerShell already installed on your system. We'll also assume that you have the Docker engine installed on the server that you're going to be running the container on. Um, we'll be doing that on this same server. And so you can download the application here. So I've already taken the uh, liberty of downloading the application. So let's go and see that right there. And there's my downloaded application. And I have also gone ahead and already extracted it out to this file. So let's get this directory. So now I'll just open up uh, PowerShell. Let's change the directory over to the files that we just expanded and let's go ahead and run the install so now it's going to ask us if we accept the terms and conditions and of course we do and now it'll go through the installation process all right so it's set up the uh, the app tells us what version we're running, and it even gives us a helpful hint on how to get started next. So let's go ahead and run the app to container init, 
what that's going to do is going to configure the system. So workspace directory path for artifacts. Well, I don't want to go there. Let's just add a new one. AWS profile. Uh, since you've already installed the AWS tools for PowerShell, then you'll probably already have a default AWS profile configured. So that's what I'm going to go ahead and use here. Optional S3 bucket for application artifacts. So this bucket's going to be used when you do the extraction. Um, also, the containerize command will use the extracted components to create the application container if the Amazon S3 bucket is configured. The default is no bucket. However, if you don't put in a bucket here, you'll not be able to complete the deployment of your containers into ECS. So with that in mind, I'm going to use a bucket that I've already created, and that is cunningly called app to container reinvent. Check that I spelled it all right. Okay. So now you get to choose whether or not to allow usage metrics to be sent back to AWS. Uh, this data is information about things like the host operating system, application type, and the app to container commands that you run. The default is to allow the collection of metrics. Uh, please allow the collection of these metrics so that we can continue to, to, to improve the tool. So the next configuration is about uploading logs and tool artifacts if there's a crash or an internal error. The default is to allow it. Uh, well, while of course we don't really expect this to ever happen, in case it does, you'll give us all the information that we need to diagnose and fix whatever may have caused that problem. I'm sure it won't do you any good when you're trying to run the app, but it may make it better for the next time. So please allow this as well. And this last choice is whether or not you should require images to be signed using Docker Content Trust. Docker Content Trust, uh, DCT, it, it provides the ability to use digital, digital signatures for, uh, for data sent to and received from remote Docker registries. You know, through DCT, image publishers can uh, sign their images and image consumers can ensure that the images that they pull are signed. It's really a way to, to validate trust on the Docker image itself. The default is no, and that's what I'm going to go with. So we've now configured apt container. So the next step is to analyze the server and then a specific application. So the first thing that you need to do is get an inventory of all of the running applications on the server. apt container inventory. So as you can see, there's three different applications running. If I open up IIS, you'll see that there's three sites running. There's e-commerce, NOP, and timesheets. E-commerce, NOP, and timesheets. So those match. Uh, while we're here, let's go ahead and decide that we're going to containerize the e-commerce. Let's go take a look at what that is just so that when we containerize it, we can see that it matches. So here it's just a very simple web app that goes into a database, pulls out some, some different data items, including the uh, category and then the detail, and it just tosses them on the page. So let's go back into here. Now, since that's the one that we decided to, let's go ahead and analyze that. App to contain, wow, well, that was good. App to container, analyze, application ID. Now let's go ahead and analyze it. Oh, well, that was pretty quick. So the next step then is to transform your application. So the transform phase, it, it really depends on, on where you're running your steps. Uh, in the case that we're doing right now where we're containerizing the application on the application service, there's one route. If we're going to be containerizing the application on a worker machine, there's a slightly different route. So we'll talk about what would happen on the worker machine first. So if you're going to use a worker machine for containerization and deployment, then you need to use an extract command first. So that would look something like this. App 
application. You think I get used to this? So it looks something like that. And what that would do is go ahead, create a zip file of all of the information that the Apto Container tool thinks that needs to go along with the uh, with the application. All the information that's contained on this server, so that that zip file can get picked up, moved over to another server, either through that shared S3 bucket that we configured or whether you just pick up the zip file and move it over. So that's what the extract command does. Since we're not going to do that here, we'll go ahead with the containerize. Now, if you were using the, uh, the extract, once you bring over the uh, the file that you're going to be sh that you would be processing on the worker machine, you'll be running the same command. Only you would also instead of the application ID, you would be passing in the uh, the file path to that zip file that you downloaded. So now we're going to go ahead and containerize it. This may take a while. Or it may not. I was awfully pretty impressive. So as you can see, we've generated a deployment file. We've uh, generated the Docker file updates, all of that. So the next step would be to just go ahead and deploy our application. So let's do that. App to container generate app deployment deploy application ID da. let's check it's all right app to container generate the app deployment and I want to deploy with the application ID okay so it's done the prerequisite checks it's created the ECR repository it's registered the text that task definition, and it's uploaded the CloudFormation resources, and it's initiated the CloudFormation stack creation. And it says we can open the AWS CloudFormation console to take a look. So let's go and get that and bring that over. So you can see we've already got the CloudFormation In here, we've got a couple in progress. If we go into them, we can see a little more view of it. But as you can probably imagine, this is all going to take a little bit of a time here. You can see there's still a lot of create in progress. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the video for now and rejoin when all of it is complete. All right, we're back. So the CloudFormation stacks all show that the creation is completed. And if we go back onto our server, it'll say that the ECS deployment is successful. And it even gives us a URL to the load balancer endpoint. So let's grab that value, copy that out. Yeah, yeah, and let's go. Ah, you gotta love running I I or Internet Explorer on a server, don't you? Let's add this one for now. And there we go. You can see we're going to the newly deployed cluster and we're getting the exact same value as we got from our local system. And so now that everything is deployed, the last step that you really may want to do but you don't have to do is you can go in and you can clean up all of the installed files so since i'm running under the administrator user here if i come into the administrator i'll see the app to container folder and this contains the all the configuration and the actual running application after the install so i can go ahead and delete this and pretty much the whole concept is uninstalled. We can also remove the files from here if we desire. You don't have to, but 
that would be the last cleanup stage. So as a recap, Apti Container supports the containerization of Java applications running on Linux and ASP.NET applications running on Windows. So if you're looking to containerize Java apps, Apti Container for Linux provides the same support that we just went through. The application supports the identification of running apps, that same inventory command that we ran earlier. You run the same analyze command, and then you can transform your Java apps in the same way, with the two different paths depending upon the machine that you're running on. The Java frameworks that it supports include Tomcat, Spring Boot, uh, JBoss, WebLogic, and WebSphere, with JBoss, WebLogic, and WebSphere all needing to be in standalone mode. Uh, the Linux distributions that are supported include Ubuntu, CentOS, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or RHEL, and Amazon Linux. When you're looking at Windows, you need to be running your applications on Windows Server 2016 or later, uh, mainly because the earlier operating systems did not support containers. You also must be on IS 7.5 or later, and your application needs to be in .NET Framework 3.5 or later. There are also some unsupported .NET application types. Those include ASP.NET applications that depend on WCF, as well as applications that are either using files or registries outside of IIS web application directories, or they may depend on other Windows services or processes outside of IIS. So as I hope you're able to see, Apti Container can be a, a powerful tool in your toolbox and help you bring those apps along with you in your journey to the cloud, um, whether they're you know, those straggler apps that we all have or other uh, applications where, container where containerizing them yourselves would be much more complicated. Also, as you saw, it was pretty quick and relatively painless to do. You know, it makes for a pretty boring demo, but a really powerful application. The longest part of the entire process is actually deploying the containers to ECS. And I guarantee you that it was faster than what it would, have, what it would be if you were trying to do it manually especially if I was trying to do it manually. So thank you for your time. You know, I mentioned that I'm an enterprise developer advocate. There are actually four of us, and you can reach all of us at that email address on the screen. If you're on Twitter, please follow me at Bill Vest. I make an effort to keep everyone informed about any interesting happenings, uh, either around this app or any of the other apps that we have on our portfolio designed to make the, the life of a .NET developer easier. Um, I also will, will publicize any .NET training sessions that we may be putting on, as well as any other new releases that may impact .NET and enterprise developers. Also, as you work with Apti Container, we would love to hear about it. Please send over your stories and any ideas that you may have around making Apti Container better. Thank you again.